Hey everybody, in this video we're going to look at a test for monotonicity. So a subtitle for this video could be using the derivative to understand the monotonicity of a function. The idea is pretty simple. If you were to calculate the derivative of a function f and you found that the value of the derivative was positive at some argument c, then you'd know the slope of the tangent is positive, so you'd have this sort of upward sloping tangent line. And the point is, it sort of indicates that the function really wants to be increasing near c. So we need to figure out this relationship between the sine, S-I-G-N, of the first derivative and the monotonicity, i.e. the property of either being increasing or decreasing, of the function. Now clearly we have to be a little bit careful about this. Just because the derivative is positive in one place doesn't mean that right next door to it there could be some decreasing behavior. So there has to be some sort of explicit relationship between where the derivative is positive, negative, where the function's increasing, decreasing. So we're going to square away some of those details in this video. So here's the basic theorem that we're going to riff on for the rest of the video. We're going to extend and generalize this theorem, but this is pretty much the heart of it right here. Suppose f is differentiable on an open interval from alpha to beta, and f prime of x is greater than zero whenever x is between alpha and beta. So we're saying the value of the derivative is positive everywhere inside of, a, inside of an open interval. Then f is strictly increasing on that open interval. So here's what the proof looks like. Choose any pair of arguments a and b inside the open interval with a being less than b. So we're going to pick any pair of points inside the open interval. Now we're going to focus our attention on the closed interval from a to b. And now here's a key moment. We know f is differentiable on the larger open interval and therefore continuous. So when you restrict your attention to the closed interval from a to b, you know it's continuous on the closed interval. And since it was differentiable on the original open interval, you can restrict your attention to this smaller open interval a to b and it'll be differentiable there. So everything restricts nicely. That's a short way of putting this. Now the mean value theorem applied to the closed interval from a to b guarantees the existence of an argument c somewhere between a and b where the value of the derivative at c is actually equal to the average rate of change of f on the interval from a to b. So we have this equation. We know there's some argument c somewhere in the middle where this is true. Now, we also know by hypothesis that the derivative value is always positive everywhere on this open interval. So we know that this derivative value right here is positive. So we could draw a little tangent slope here to indicate that we know that the tangent slope there must be positive. Now, knowing what we know about the mean value theorem, we can imagine what something like the secant slope has to look like. And it's pretty clear that the secant slope, since it's the same as that tangent slope, we know that these two sort of endpoints of the graph there, where you, you see a comma f of a and b comma f of b, you have to have an increasing graph. You have to have values that go up as you move from the point A to point B, because that secant slope has to be the same as the tangent slope. So let's square away the algebra and prove it rigorously. Obviously, b minus a is positive. And because this quotient is positive and the denominator is positive, it means that the numerator has to be positive. But of course, f of b minus f of a being greater than zero is the same as saying f of a is less than f of b. And that's really the heart of the proof. Because now we know that having chosen any pair of arguments where a is less than b, it follows that f of a is less than f of b. And that is precisely what we mean when we say that f is strictly increasing on that open interval. So that's the proof. How do we apply this theorem? So here's the function e to the x. And we think this function is strictly increasing on the whole real axis. By the way, this isn't even so obvious to the left of the origin because this graph flattens out quite a bit. So how would you even be able to recognize that the graph continued to increase? Well, we can put our mind at ease after we've done this little argument because we notice that the derivative of f has the formula e to the x as well. e to the x is its own derivative. And for all real numbers x, e to the x, in other words, the value of the derivative, has to be a positive number. We know that about the exponential function. And now we can use the theorem we just looked at to assert that f is indeed strictly increasing on the whole real axis. Here's the arctangent function. And once again, we suspect that this is strictly increasing, even though there's horizontal asymptotes in both directions. 
at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. So it flattens out. Nevertheless, we think it continues to increase as you move left to right. And now we can prove it quite easily. The derivative function is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And certainly, for all real numbers, the value of that function is positive. And because the value of the derivative is positive throughout the open interval from negative infinity to infinity, we conclude that g is strictly increasing on that interval, which is to say, g is strictly increasing on all of r. Here's the squaring function, and it's pretty clear we're not going to be able to show that it's increasing on all of r. Clearly decreases and then switches over to being increasing at the origin. So let's just focus our attention on the open interval from 0 to infinity, see what we can say about this. So the derivative function has formula 2x, and if x is greater than 0, then the value of that function is positive, and therefore h is strictly increasing on the open interval from 0 to infinity. The theorem is easily generalized to capture the case of decreasing behavior as well as a possibility of weak monotonicity. Here's the theorem recast with those variations. The theorem we just got done looking at was this statement right here. If for all x in the open interval from alpha to beta it's true that the value of the derivative is positive, then it follows that f is strictly increasing on the open interval. But there is a strictly decreasing version of this, where if you can show that the value of the derivative is negative throughout the open interval, then the function is strictly decreasing on the open interval. If you're only able to prove that the value of the derivative is greater than or equal to zero, which sometimes is the case, you're not able to demonstrate that it's strictly positive. Sometimes you have to allow for the possibility of it being equals. Well, in that case, you have a weaker conclusion, but it could still be enough for your purposes. Your conclusion there is that the function has to be weakly increasing. And if you can only show that the derivative is less than or equal to zero on the open interval, then you can conclude that the function is weakly decreasing on that open interval. If you just point to a random function, it's very unlikely that it's going to be monotonic on its domain. In other words, rarely do you have functions that are either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing throughout their domain. Most functions will have variations in the behavior, and you'd like to be able to analyze where these transitions occur. So this theorem is a really great start. Here's the derivative of sine, the cosine function. And we're going to notice, for example, that the value of the derivative is positive on the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then the value of the derivative is negative on the open interval from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And our theorem tells us then that we can conclude f is strictly increasing on the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And it's also strictly decreasing on the open interval from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So this is a typical sort of application of the theorem we were just looking at. But it's sort of a drag to leave out those endpoints. And so we'll notice that the theorem can be extended to include an endpoint of an interval when the function is continuous at that endpoint approaching from within the interval. Now that's a mouthful. It sounds awful. Really, in practice, as you use it, it'll be clear how to use it. So here is a great example of what we were just talking about. It's a variation of the original theorem we looked at at the beginning of the video. Suppose f is differentiable on the open interval from alpha to beta, and f is continuous from the left at beta. If, as before, the derivative value is positive everywhere inside the open interval, then f is strictly increasing on the semi-closed interval from alpha to beta. So what's going on here is we sort of pick up that endpoint beta and we can throw that into our conclusion. We know that f is strictly increasing on that whole interval. We're not going to prove this from scratch. We're just going to look at a sketch because most of the proof that we just showed for the earlier version of this theorem still works. The only adjustment is to account for the possibility of choosing b to be the endpoint beta. So here would be our picture. So the domain now is a semi-closed interval from alpha to beta, where beta is now in the domain of the function. And when we choose a and b, the proof would look the same unless we chose b to be an endpoint. But actually, that's going to be fine as well, because the hypothesis says the function then is continuous from the left at beta. And the point here is that when we now look at this closed interval, we can still assert 
that the function has to be continuous on this closed interval and differentiable on the open interval. In other words, we may apply the mean value theorem on the interval just like we did before, and everything else about the proof will follow. And so this is really the heart of the argument. Um, when you know your function extends to be continuous at that endpoint, then you get to throw that endpoint into the interval where you're claiming the monotonic behavior. Let's revisit the slate of options and we'll do a closed interval version for all those options. Suppose f is continuous on the closed interval from alpha to beta, differentiable on the open interval. So here we are demanding the continuity on alpha to beta closed interval now. And then you have this slate of options where the behavior of the value of the derivative on the open interval between the endpoints determines whether the function is strictly or weakly increasing or decreasing on the closed interval from alpha to beta. All right, last example. Here's the square root function. Now we notice that f is continuous on the interval from zero to infinity and it's continuous from the right at zero. So it's the semi-closed interval from zero to infinity where f is continuous. And we know that the derivative formula is one over two root x. And this tells us that the value of the derivative is positive for all x in the open interval from zero to infinity. So we are able to extend our conclusion to the endpoint and we're able to assert that the square root function is strictly increasing on the closed interval from zero to infinity.